Good morning, this is Tim Mapes, uh, Shasta County Health and Human Services in today for Carrie Schutte, our PIO for the Shasta County response for COVID-19. And I'm up in the Department Operations Center for our media briefing. We're glad you are joining us today. Um, I will start as Carrie does every week on Wednesdays with uh, just our latest numbers. So far, we have uh, total confirmed cases in Shasta County as of yesterday, 339 confirmed cases yesterday were 16, which matches our um, highest number that we've had in a single day. That's the second time that has happened. Um, to date, we've had 21,150 negative tests and a total number of tests of 21,489. Currently, we have 44 people in isolation and 252 in quarantine in Shasta County. All told, we have had eight deaths. Currently, we have 11 uh, patients hospitalized, and one of those is in the intensive care unit. Um, today, we are joined, as always, by Shasta County CEO Matt Pontus. We also have um, Assistant uh, Health Officer for Shasta County, Dr. Michael Vavakis. Um, we have Shasta County Health and Human Services Director Donnell Ewert. Uh, Robert Fulton with Mercy, uh, Dr. Karen Ramstrom, our Shasta County Health Officer, Jennifer Andrea from Mountain Valleys, and Mark Mitchelson today from Shasta Regional Medical Center. So we want to thank all of them for being here. And as we always do, if anybody has any updates right now from our group of panelists, um, please go ahead and feel free to um, give an update. Thanks a lot, Tim. I'd like to start off today by, by just reiterating some of the, or actually all of the sectors that are still not allowed to be open and functioning in Shasta County as a reminder to the public. So there are several sectors that have never been allowed to reopen since the uh, stay-at-home order issued by the governor. And those are public events and gatherings, including live audience sports, convention centers, theme parks and festivals, including water parks, higher education, which is in person, except we're supporting essential workforce activities, indoor playgrounds, including bounce centers, ball pits, and laser tag, saunas and steam rooms, recreational team sports. In addition, on July 13th, because of increasing uh, incidence of COVID-19 in California, the governor rescinded some of the uh, the opening of some of the other sectors that had been allowed to open, and this is statewide, and that includes dine-in restaurants, so that means in-person eating inside in a restaurant, wineries and tasting rooms, movie theaters, family entertainment centers, including bowling alleys, miniature golf, arcades, zoos and museums, indoor museums, that is, card rooms, and then bars, brew pubs, breweries, and pubs, are also required to close unless they serve alcohol in the same transaction as a meal. And if they do that, they must operate outside. In addition, there are more than 35 counties now on what's called the state monitoring list. And this is a list of counties that have a, a very concerning incidents or hospital capacity issues. We are not on that list. Shasta County is not on the monitoring list. But if, you, if we were, the following sectors would also have to close, and that's gyms and fitness centers, places of worship and cultural ceremonies, including weddings and funerals, indoor protests, offices for non-critical infrastructure sectors, personal care services, including uh, nail salons and massage parlors, hair salons and barbershops, shopping malls, and tattoo parlors, uh, also that do piercing and electrolysis. So, it's very essential that everyone in Shasta County help do their part to help keep us off the monitoring list. They can do so by staying home when they're sick, monitor, uh, wearing a face mask or face covering when in public, and um, all the businesses can also uh, assist us by conforming to the requirements the governor has set forth. Uh, right now, we have a situation in Shasta County where most businesses and thank you to the business community. Most businesses are complying with uh, the requirements uh, in the state order. However, there are some businesses that are not, and those businesses are creating an unfair uh, playing field for the businesses that are complying. And uh, Shasta County will be 
uh, looking at various civil measures uh, to take if those businesses do not come into compliance. All right, thank you, Donnell. Um, anybody else have any other updates that they would like to share? This is Jennifer with Mountain Valley's Health Centers. And just a reminder that we have drive up testing or drive through testing um, at our Bernie and Fall River Health Centers on Thursdays in partnership with Shasta County. So if anybody in Eastern Shasta County in our rural region out here in Fall River and Bernie area want to get tested, um, every Thursday um, through July and August will be rotating our testing sites at either Fall River Health Center or our Burden Health Center. All right, thank you. Anybody else? And seeing no other updates, uh, for our media that are on the call, if you would like to begin asking your questions, we are ready for you. Um, I've got a couple questions for Dr. Ramstrom, I think. Um, we've seen the number of cases rise, I would say, significantly in the last few days. How concerned are you about that? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned. You know, um, we're at a kind of a critical time right now because we want to um, ensure that we are all implementing you know, all these prevention practices routinely in our daily lives so that we can actually keep our numbers to a manageable level um, in terms of the number of people that are impacted um, and how our, our hospitals are impacted in particular. And certainly we do, do not want people to acquire this infection and, um, you know, some people can get really, really very sick and we've had a number of deaths as well. And so that's very, very concerning. Um, and we're, we're, we're in, a, in a space right now where we want to try and minimize that in particular because we want our schools to go to resume. And so um, we um, really um, uh, want to encourage people now is a critical time um, to make sure that you're implementing those practices every day. So when you're out and about, you're wearing a mask. Um, and, you know, we continue to see um, cases that come up. Um, oftentimes it's people, whether it's... Um, extended family or even just small groups of friends, that kind of a thing, um, um, who are infecting each other. Um, a lot of our cases come from close contacts of our existing cases. And so um, this is still spreading and um, we are not immune. Um, we're in the same place as we were um, several months ago in terms of in that regard. So um, people really just need to do their best. I know this is new learned behaviors and uh, um, to um, mask and physically distance and um, limit um, exposure to other individuals um, as much as possible. It has been a, a week tonight since the incident under the uh, Sundial Bridge. Are you worried at all about this catching the governor's attention that anything would happen or has it been long enough now where you figure we're still okay? Uh, so our understanding is, is that individual has been traveling around, unfortunately, um, to different cities um, which and different states, which is incredibly um, uh, unfortunate and irresponsible, in my opinion, and, um, and bringing people together, um, perhaps with good intentions, I don't know, but um, it's not the time to get people together from, very, from you know, uh, large groups like that, um, particularly from different households, from the surrounding area. Um, there can be a draw from, you know, even outside of our county. So um, we'll, we'll see what happens over the next two weeks. We'll cross our fingers and um, ho hopefully it will not impact us, but, but we don't know. We'll have to see. But you're not really worried about any repercussions from the governor, from the state over that? Well, I guess my point is, is that we know we're not alone. This is not a, was not a locally planned event. Um, these have been popping up in other cities. And so I think, you know, it should be very apparent that this was not something that we planned or had um, control over here in our county. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, Dr. Ramstrom. This is Ethan Hansen, sports reporter for the record, sir. So I, um, I just, I, I had a couple of questions real briefly. Um, ha, uh, have there been uh, guidelines released by the state yet as far as how high school sports uh, can, can return? And uh, my follow-up question uh, is, have the commissioners from Eastern Athletic League and from the Northern Athletic League, which uh, governs uh, UPREP, Shasta, Foothill, Enterprise, uh, Central Valley, um, West Valley, have those uh, commissioners, have they come to you with a proposal uh, to, uh, to allow sports uh, to potentially to return? Those are my two questions. So we, like you, are really um, anxiously awaiting the state guidance on um, youth sports. And um, we had a call, um, I believe it was just last night, actually, and that's, it may come out today. Um, we've been waiting for weeks and uh, thought it was going to come out last week, and it didn't. Um, but it sounds like um, it will be this week, and so hopefully today, if not um, by the end of the week. And so once we have that information, then potentially we could have those conversations, but we don't have, there's, I don't have any um, information yet in terms of the state requirements to have a conversation. I have not been approached by the commissioners. Um, there is not um, a current um, method for local decisions around this, because um, we're waiting for the state guidance to come out with more specificity than what we know right now, which is no recreational sports. So um, we'll see, hopefully in the next day or two, we'll, we'll know more. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate you. Have a good one. Okay, so going back to the worship gathering and um, related big events, I we've been getting a lot of comments, and you guys probably have as well, um, kind of questioning the response to the worship gathering, um, the rodeo, sundial, or we talked about sundial, uh, what was the other one, Waterworks Park, and then the protests back in early June. I mean, you know, in some ways, in terms of, you know, outdoor large gatherings, they were pretty similar. Um, and that's a national, you know, conversation I see happening as well, not just here, but just because the county did take the measure to kind of, you know, send out press releases even about the rodeo and, um, and the other events. And I know you guys, guys did address the protests at some of these briefings, but it wasn't quite as much of a like kind of public condemnation. So I just wanted to hear from you guys what, you know, what played into the response of how to handle those public events where there was possible transmission. Uh, so I guess I would just say that we know that gatherings are risky and there are certain types of gatherings that are protected activities, including um, protests and um, church gatherings, and those need to be done with specific prevention parameters in place, including physical distancing and mask use. Um, and so when we hear about events that are outside of those parameters, then um, we do our best in, in advance, typically. We hope to be able to stop those from happening. Um, and we don't always hear about things in advance or have control over those. And so um, I, I'm not sure specifically other than that what your question is, but we would not be um, doing any kind of press release about it. I mean, protests are allowed. We hope that people implement the prevention practices. Um, and uh, same, same with any types of church gatherings. If you're talking about the Sundial Bridge, that was neither of those. That was um, more of a... A gathering of a bunch of people like they would normally gather when we don't have a pandemic. Yeah, I just meant because you did, there was a press release sent out about the sundial gathering and um, yeah, just, just trying to understand the difference since they're, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, they're both supposed to be constitutionally protected. Um, so Donnell, I don't know if there's something you wanted to mention. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would like to add a couple of things. Uh, number one, um, there there was quite a bit of difference between the, the face covering behavior at the protests versus the event at the Sundial Bridge and the Cottonwood Rodeo. Um, so that's definitely one issue. Both, you know, worship services 
of any size are allowed outside if there is social distancing. And uh, we acknowledge that in the press release, we took issue with the, the lack of social distancing, the, the restricted uh, venue, which didn't allow people to social distance and the lack of face mask wearing. The protests, uh, the people were able to spread out in a larger area. They were for the most part wearing masks. So that, that is one key difference. I think an, another very, very important difference is uh, protests by their very nature are protests against the government. Uh, and it does not seem appropriate for the government to condemn a protest against the government. Uh, it, we, we do have the First Amendment, the Constitution, and uh, people have the right for, to bear their grievances against the government. In California, they can do so if they follow certain guidelines. Um, there are protests every Tuesday at the Board of Supervisors, and there's no mask wearing going on, and we do not issue press releases about that. So I think if you look at our, uh, our practices in relation to addressing protests, we've been very consistent. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I just had one unrelated question about contact tracing also. Um, somebody brought this up yesterday and I had never really thought too much about it. I was just curious, how much is contact tracing just kind of based on the honor system? Like, is that an issue where people, um, you, you either are directly told or kind of suspect that they're not being honest about all the people they've come in contact with and all the places they've been? Uh, so thank you for bringing up that topic. I think um, it is unrecognized how much hard work our public health staff are um, putting into um, talking to our cases, um, helping them to meet their, their needs um, and investigating those cases and helping those individuals to identify their contacts. Um, it, it, you know, it can be difficult um, to look back and we have strategies for how we help people to kind of remember where they were and who they were around. Um, it's a lot of work and uh, con uh, case investigation and contact tracing is one of our key strategies for um, keeping our numbers down and our uh, capacity to do that is maximized right now and it's a huge burden and workload um, uh, for our DOC response. I think our staff are who do that work are very uh, under-recognized, which is unfortunate. The people that they talk to and that they uh, reassure and help to direct to medical services should they need that or um, provide them other information um, so that those individuals can protect um, their families and loved ones is really important service. And those individuals, I think, appreciate it very, very much. Um, we do, I will tell you, have uh, concerning to me a growing number of individuals who don't want to talk to our staff and to share that information, um, which is their choice. But at the same time, it also prevents us from helping that person to uh, protect the people they've been around, um, which can be people you know that they're they're close with, that they're their family and friends, and are, we are hoping that those individuals notify them uh, so those individuals could look out for symptoms and take care of themselves as well. So. Um, it, it is a growing problem and it's unfortunate. And, um, you know, personally, I would love to see signs up on the freeway that say, thank you, public health. Thank you, our public health nurses for doing the work that you're doing because it makes a big difference in this community. And, and oftentimes those staff are not treated very nicely. And, um, it, 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 uh, breaks my heart actually every day seeing how hard they're working. And, um, certainly there's some individuals that appreciate that and others who are very, um, who are, who are actually hostile to them. And so um, to answer your question directly, sometimes people don't get up, up that information and uh, we just encourage people um, to do what's right. And if you're not gonna let us know, please notif notify people yourselves because those individuals uh, deserve to know if they were exposed to you while you were infectious. Thank you for that response. I've got a bit of a follow-up because I, I just got some information that it, I don't know if you can or, or would know to confirm this, but I'm told at least nine people who went to that worship service uh, have tested positive and Bethel has sent out an email telling uh, everybody who was there to self-quarantine. Are you aware of that? Is that true? Can you even comment on that? 
Yeah, I haven't talked to our staff today about their investigation, what they found today. So I, I, I don't have that information. I can't comment on that. Sorry, Mike. Is that something that you could? Should, should it become the information become available? You know, I would say that we um, report aggregate information like we normally would if that, you know, depending on what we find. Um, usually we, um, it takes some time, it takes time for all of these things to kind of play out. And we, we normally will not report until we actually have kind of full information. And because this disease can take a while to, um, you know, to, for people to become infectious, we, we wouldn't do that yet because it hasn't been long enough since that event occurred. So we'll have to see what, what comes up. And then we will um, share that information as, as that investigation um, is finalized. I understand. Thank you. Also, Mike, if you have that email and you can forward that to me, I'd appreciate it. Oops, come back here. There. Sorry, Donnell. I don't. I, that's just from a text from somebody. So I have not seen the email myself. Um, that I was just seeing if you guys maybe had seen it. And also, I just wanted to add, um, you know, when it comes to cases, also, it, what might kind of hinder some of the, the process for the contact tracing and that type of thing for an event like the Sundial Bridge is we wouldn't necessarily know about cases that are outside of Shasta County. And, and I, I know we had heard that some of those folks that gathered there were from out of the area. So that kind of might hinder the response as well. Um, and then Elena, I just wanted to also add, and when it comes to the, um, response and the perceived different difference of response to the different uh, incidents. Um, part of what also plays into it also is, you know, there was some advance um, discussion with the organizers of that Sundial Bridge gathering and, um, you know, officials were, were kind of told that it was going to be a small gathering and that face masking was going to be um, in, in force and that was, that was not the case. Thanks for that update, Tim. Actually, I do have one more question, not about that, back to the contact tracing, um, what you said, Dr. Ramstrom. Do you know, I would just be curious what you think is behind people's kind of growing resistance. I mean, obviously not, not even locally, just nationally, there's a lot of people who are mistrusting of, you know, government in general and the response to this pandemic, but I was just curious what that might be about um, if it's increasing. Yeah, yeah, you know, I don't know. I think um, all of us are worn out, right? I mean, this is just really hard. And um, and then to be told that you tested positive, you know, presumably these people are either going to their doctor or they're going to a screening site. So they're getting tested for a reason, some reason. Um, so, you know, and I, I think, um, you know, we all have to be very careful too. And I think our staff are very professional and, and do this on a daily basis to, to, be, to not be judgmental either because any of us are vulnerable. You know, we all do our best. This is behavior change. We're all learning. And so, oh, you might forget, oh gosh, I left my, you know, my, uh, my mask in my car. Let me go back and get it or what have you. And so sometimes, you know, we're human and we, we slip up and so, there is opportunity to get exposed. And um, so potentially maybe that's part of it. They feel they may be judged. And um, I just would reassure people that is not the case based on our, the way that we do our work at public health. You know, we take each individual case um, uh, on, you know, and, and treat people with um, professionally and with compassion. And, um, you know, perhaps it's related to just, uh, you know, pandemic fatigue, but it could also be um, from um, other people who are, whether in, in the media or social media or, or other, other people who are dismissing this activity. Um, I, I don't know where it's coming from, perhaps a combination of all of those things, but I guess I would just reassure the public and encourage you to um, pick up the phone when our staff call. Um, they're really doing their best to protect our community and they can really only do that if, if, um, if you talk with them. Thank you. I think one other possible misunderstanding is when we do contact tracing, we do not reveal the identity of the case to the contacts. Um, 
you know, we, we have a way of saying that to let someone know they've been exposed and therefore, you know, have to go into quarantine, but we do not reveal, you know, who it is that um, is the case. So confidentiality is maintained. So people don't need to be concerned that we're going to uh, release that information to anybody. Any other media questions today? I do. Can you hear me okay? Good morning. Um, yeah. I, um, there was a mention early on in the call about looking at possible civil measures for the non-compliant businesses. What form would that take? And is law enforcement involved in that at all? Thank you for that question. Uh, you know, we we are trying to take a little bit of a middle road on this. Uh, you know, I think early on there was talk about doing education. I think we we've done quite a bit of education. I think uh, at this point there aren't a lot of people in the community ignorant of what needs to be done. And I I think if there is non-compliance, it is intentional non-compliance. On the other hand, I don't think most people in the community feel like we want to charge people with crimes either. So, uh, you know, what we're looking at is some other regulatory uh, leverage we may have related to businesses that we can use. Uh, and you may have seen that recently with the Waterworks Park. Uh, but also, you know, we we have uh, some other, other civil measures we can take as far as um, court action and so forth against businesses that aren't they're breaking the law. And law enforcement's part in that would be? Uh, it, it's the attorneys. It's not it's not law enforcement uh, per se. It's uh, it's more it's a civil action that would be carried out through our regulatory uh, arms of county government as well as uh, our county council's office. I would also just like to repeat again uh, our thanks, all the businesses that have complied, and these actions that you know we that we're contemplating are to create a level playing field for the business community. We um, feel strongly that the the businesses that are complying shouldn't be punished by uh, by that unlevel playing field. And our goal is to try to keep more business sectors open. We really are doing this for the business community uh, because there are many sectors that are. Would have to close down if we end up on the monitoring list and you know there are many counties now in the sacramento valley that are on the monitoring list including glenn calusa yuba sutter butte counties and you know we are doing our best to try to stay off of that list and keep those many sectors that i listed earlier open uh, in addition what i forgot to mention earlier is our schools uh, can provide uh, in-person education if we're not on the monitoring list. If we are on the monitoring list, then they only are allowed to do distance learning. So that is why uh, we feel like we need to be uh, a little more uh, active in uh, addressing some of these concerns with the businesses that are not complying, that are need, that need to be closed or need to be doing their businesses outside right now. Thank you. I have one more question that's sort of related, um, and that's about Waterworks Park is one facility, but what makes it any different from the Aquatic Center in Reading? Well, the, the, the definition of a water park has to do with the slides and rides and so forth, um, and the, the slides and, and other attractions like that at the Aquatic Center are closed. Um, they are operating under guidance for childcare for their um, children's camps. And they uh, implement social distancing in a very small cohort of groups. In other words, the groups of children do not interact, intermix. They stay with their group and they uh, practice social distancing. And um, they also are doing uh, the swim team activities out there using social distancing. So, um, you know, they they're operating that under those other just different guidances and they're not operating as a an attraction with open um, to the public type of water activities that the water park is doing that makes sense thank you
Any other questions? Well, hearing none, um, I would just like to close today. We wanted to let the media and also the public know about a change in our reporting, daily reporting numbers that we're going to be making this week. Um, typically, for the last few months, we've done those reports daily, you know, at or slightly before 6 p.m. And what we're going to be doing starting, it'll be Monday. Um, so Friday will be the last report that we give at that time, at, at the current time of just before six o'clock or at six o'clock. Um, and what we will be doing is reporting the daily numbers um, from the day previous um, starting, and it'll be earlier in the day. So um, Friday, we will still have our normal report that goes out, um, you know, at or before six o'clock, but then starting Monday, um, the day's numbers will come out Earlier in the day on Monday, we will get a more of a scheduled time um, that's uh, good for the media to um, be able to report on. Um, this is actually consistent with how other regions and other counties are delivering their numbers. Um, it, it makes it a little bit easier on the staff to get those accurate numbers. Um, I guess we found the, the six o'clock time frame. there are still some tests potentially that are being done for that day, and if you were to miss that cutoff time, those would have to be reported the next day anyway. So this is going to also be able to get a more accurate number daily where um, the numbers from the day before will be able to be recorded. So we also will not, uh, along with uh, being consistent with the other regions and counties, not be reporting those numbers on say Saturdays and Sundays. So how this will look next week on Monday, we will have a report that comes out earlier in the day and you will get the numbers for Saturday and Sunday. Friday will not be included because we're still going to finish out this week the way we have been doing it. Um, and then on Tuesday of next week, you would get the numbers for Monday, and that'll be earlier in the day. That should help with the, the deadlines for the media as well. Um, we know those numbers coming out at six o'clock often is hard for the cutoff time for going to print and also for um, television media as well. So um, we will have more explaining this in the uh, daily report that comes out on Friday. So if there are no other questions, I am going to say thank you all for joining us today. And uh, we will talk to you next week, Wednesday, and Carrie Schutte will be back. Thank you guys.